right, so we will get started. And I want to thank everyone for joining us for this evening's workshop, Native Plant and Pollinator Gardens. And I want to start with a couple of introductions. I'm Shelly Ryder. I'm the Environmental Programs Manager for the City of Millbrae. We have with us this evening, helping to moderate as well, Megan Kelly, who works with me, Environmental Programs Coordinator, and Andrea Chow, the Sustainability Analyst for the City of San Mateo. So our cities are <laughs> co-sponsoring this along with BOSCA, the Bay Area Water Supply and Conservation Agency. And we'll introduce our wonderful instructor, Juanita Salisbury, at the end. We wanna go through a few slides that outline some of the programs that we offer along with uh, BOSCA. Uh, so I also want to mention to everyone that we are recording this workshop and they will be available on the Bosca uh, website and um, I'll scroll down to that in a couple of, well, probably in a few slides of Bay Area uh, Conservation.org. So you'll be able to watch not only if you want to rewatch this workshop, but watch other workshops as well. So um, everyone is muted by default. Um, at the end, uh, Juanita will take questions and Megan and Andrea will help to navigate that. We have two ways that you can answer, you can ask questions. One is you can do the raise hand feature that's at the bottom along the, the toolbar at the bottom. If you wanna ask a live question, um, Andrea will uh, enable that, or you can ask, via the Q&A and type in your question and Megan um, will read those aloud and Juanita will answer those. But we're gonna take those at the end so that we can make sure that we get through all the slides and give you all of the information. And I already mentioned we're recording this. Uh, Bosca, if you're not familiar with Bosca, they represent 26 agencies, including the city of Millbrae and Calwater, where the city of San Mateo, that's their water supplier, and it, it includes a couple of other agencies and districts representing 1.8 million people, not a bunch of businesses and other counties as well, Alameda, Santa Clara, in addition to San Mateo County. Bosca basically helps us to with high quality supply of water at a fair price. So they work with the SFPUC and help us with some of our programs as well. So we're um, happy to be a member of Bosca. The reason we're doing this workshop and why Bosca offers it as well is that water conservation is one of the leading things that we can all do to conserve water. And outdoor water use is the single largest usage. So this workshop, along with some of the others, will help all of us to be able to conserve water. And by planting water efficient plants and techniques, and that's what Juanita will go over this evening. So there's a lot of opportunities and we'll talk about those programs as well. So the city of San Mateo and Millbrae and a number of other cities within the county or the other counties um, offer a rain barrel, rain barrel rebate program. There's three different levels. One is um, 50 to 99, 50 gallon, 99 gallon rain barrel. It's $100, up to $100. If you get a rain barrel that's 100 to 199 gallons, you can get a rebate for up to $150. Um, dollars. And now we're offering rebates for cisterns for up to $200. So there's a great opportunity and that rain is coming. So um, you may want to look at that sooner than later. And then we also have, and some of the other cities also have the Lawn Be Gone program. And this is for replacing lawns that are currently using water, getting irrigated to replace them with native and drought tolerant plants. Different cities offer different amounts for that and not all cities participate, but you can find out if your city participates in any of these programs at bayareaconservation.org. And so a new feature of the Long Be Gone program is a rain garden rebate, and that's for a $300 rebate, but you have to be a part of the Long Be Gone program. So it's just really great opportunities to transform your landscaping. And then some of the cities, including Millbury, we participate in the smart controller rebate in installation program. It's the ratio three smart irrigation controller. And so it's simply replacing your current controller, your older one with this one, and that's another way to conserve water. And so uh, Andrea will um, provide the rest of the slides. Sure. And so you guys are probably familiar with the website now, but at BayAreaConservation.org, you can also look at the schedule for upcoming workshops. And so this time might be more convenient for you uh, at night, but we're also providing workshops on the weekends and they cover a variety of topics. So sh you should definitely check that out uh, and register for Bosca's upcoming webinars. Uh, next slide. 
I also want to point you to BayAreaGardening.org. There's going to be a lot of different tools and resources gone over in the upcoming presentation, but just you're looking for more ideas and especially lots of pictures, which I think are very helpful. There's a lot of different resources and galleries of photos of different plants and a plant selection tool and a watering calculator. So this could be a really powerful resource for you as well. Uh, and then last slide, I just wanted to share a few other sustainability programs that might be interested to you. Uh, I know we have a variety of community members on this webinar. So mo most of these programs actually apply to everyone in the Bay Area. And so I'll start with the, our solar and battery discounts through Bay Area SunShares. And you can find them by uh, going to bayareasunshares.com. Uh, but there will be solar and battery discounts through November 30th. Uh, you might also be interested in electric appliance rebates through BayRen. Uh, that's best reached through bayren.org, rebates for induction cooktops and dryers and other energy efficiency opportunities. And then specifically for our San Mateo County residents out there, you can actually receive electric vehicle discounts up to $1,000 in rebates if you're purchasing an electric vehicle this fall. So I really encourage you if you're interested in any of these things, there's so many different types of discounts and rebates out there. I've listed the websites for Milray and San Mateo sustainability, but I'm sure your city, if you're not in either of our cities, also has some sustainability uh, resources on their web pages. So I encourage you to take a look and take advantage of rebates and so you can save some money too. And that's all I have. Great, thank you, and <laughs> thank you, Andrea. I'm going to um, stop sharing, and I want to introduce Juanita Salisbury. She is our instructor this evening. I'll let her tell you about herself and, and background. And so um, let's do that. And I'm going to suggest, why don't you um, share yours? I'll suggest that the rest of us go off screen and uh, mute and uh, take it away, Juanita. OK, very good. All right, let's start the slideshow. Uh, slideshow, here we go. Uh, from beginning. Okay, well, um, as I was introduced, I am Juanita Salisbury. I'm a landscape architect. I also have a, a PhD in biopsychology. Uh, that degree was, um, uh, the focus was on ingestive behavior, eating and drinking. And so um, now that I do uh, habitat gardens as a landscape architect, I'm uh, really providing a, a lot of food resources for um, our, our uh, pollinators and other insects. So I'm still doing uh, ingestive behavior just in a slightly different way. Um, and you can follow what I do on Facebook and Instagram at the Primrose Way Pollinator Garden and also my YouTube channel, Primrose Way. Okay, the overview. What am I going to talk about tonight? Um, six things. The public gardens that we have, um, garden components, what to plant and why, basic planting design and pollinators and then maintenance protocols. So it's kind of a broad overview of some very uh, useful information, very specific techniques um, and some really good science and also featuring a number of my uh, macro photography of, of the insects that I watch eating my um, offerings. So we have five gardens. Uh, the first garden that I have here uh, Primrose Way Pollinator Garden here in Palo Alto. Um, the second garden, Arcadia Place. The third garden, Island Drive. Um, the fourth one, Gwinda Street Pollinator Garden. And then the Hopkins Avenue Pollinator Garden. And you can Google Pollinator Gardens Palo Alto uh, for going for a virtual tour if you don't want to go in person. And um, let's... Uh, I just want to talk about these gardens a little bit because this is how this all this started really. Um, so here was the Primrose Garden before in uh, 2016. And here's Embarcadero Road. Um, here it's a busy four lane street, the sidewalk, 
um, a planting strip here and a planting strip there and a utility cabinet. Um, I live just around the corner from this area and I approached the uh, parks and open space to see if I could design and install a pollinator garden using uh, California native plants. And I offered to do everything, and this was key, uh, design, site preparation, fundraising, volunteer coordination, installation and maintenance. And the city was so great. And they said, show us your plan. And that got us off and running. And uh, this was the garden in 2019, a couple of years after being installed. I like to think of this as the, the, the peak of its, of its bloom in spring, just a beautiful space. Another vision there, um, again, looking that's looking west. Um, everything's beautifully backlit. Again, all native California plants, um, a wonderful resource for pollinators. So let's talk about the components of a pollinator garden. What do you need? Four things. Food, of course, it's all about the mealtime. Water or moisture. Shelter, very important and nesting sites, because if you provide food, you're going to have mating going on because that's what they do um, when they're well fed, they want to reproduce. And so with these four items, how do we optimize them to make our garden, our pollinator garden and habitat as productive as possible? That is to provide as much as we can for as many species as we can. And the answer to that is that we start with plants. And why do we start with plants? Because, well, plants are really the beginning of everything. You have energy from the sun um, coming down to the earth, and that cosmic energy is converted by plants into food, which is then eaten by insects. Insects are great uh, eaters of plants. Um, and then those insects are then eaten by other uh, insects and other animals. So you have that solar energy getting transformed into food, caterpillars, there's a big fat caterpillar there. Um, and um, then those caterpillars then get fed to uh, baby birds and other animals. And as a rule, native plants are a very specific host for very specific insects. They like certain chemicals and not others. And so, uh, this is the rule rather than the exception. So native plants, if you want to have native insects. 37% uh, of animal species are plant eating insects and uh, many animals rely on insects to access the stored energy of the sun. Um, there's really no other way to get the sun's energy except through plants. Okay, so obviously then the, the conclusion then is that plants, even though they're pretty, they have beautiful blossoms, maybe some nice form and foliage and textures, the main function of a plant is to provide food for something. Um, and so here's an example um, of a plant that I planted over at the Island Drive Garden. This is Malacothamnus fasciculatus. And I bought this plant because it had holes in it and it had some caterpillars. So I knew that it was going to uh, provide a food source. Um, we, we really can't stress enough how important it is to plant native plants uh, for getting that energy up the food chain to the rest of the animal population. Um, a great study was done. This is a, an example here of that uh, uh, that uh, uh, fact, you need a minimum of 70% of native plants in gardens to provide enough uh, food for uh, a population of chickadees. It takes a lot of caterpillars to make one bird. Um, I think it was something like 7,000 caterpillars equaled one, one chickadee. So, um, and these are pictures actually from our gardens. We have, um, actually these are some of them are in my actual home garden um, we have a caterpillar on scrofularia californica wonderful plant that provides a lot for for quite a number of, of species a uh, checker spot caterpillar on sedalcia here a uh, gray hair streak butterfly you can see she's actually laying an egg um, on areogonum fasciculatum and then of course the anna swallowtail caterpillar on pyridoridia 
So um, caterpillars are great uh, sources of food for baby birds. Um, and so this is to uh, grow these plants. So you want birds in your yard, you put these plants in there, you'll have, uh, you'll have butterflies and birds. So why California native plants? People often say, well, there's Mediterranean plants, drought tolerant plants. Um, so let's talk about California native plants here first. Our plants here in California evolved to be drought tolerant over millennia. Um, they're very, mo many are well adapted to our hot dry summers and uh, cool wet winters. And the native plants are largely preferred over non-native plants by pollinators. And the native plants depend largely on native pollinators for reproduction. Native plants provide the right nutrients, again, for native insect larval development, those caterpillars. Um, you can have non-native plants escaping cultivation and infesting natural areas and destroying natural ecosystems. They can bring in diseases, exotic pests, um, and it keeps native plants keep California looking like California. So here was our Gwenda garden in 2018. This uh, little triangle, it's about a thousand square feet or so of ivy. And a, there's a big valley oak there in the back. Um, and a, a person who lives across the street here told me that as a boy, he grew up in that house and that had been ivy for about 60 years. So we changed it and this is what it looks like today. This was actually this, this spring. Um, and so you can see complete transformation in literally two weeks. Again, why California native plants? California has a ridiculous number of native plants here. We are a biodiversity hotspot, one of, of just a few on the planet. So we have riches here. Uh, we have almost 8,000 species of plants here, more than uh, anywhere else um, in the United States. Uh, and one of the things I really want to point out here is that we have such a huge number of native plant species largely because of our unique ecosystems in California. We have everything. We have redwood forest, we have coastal areas, we have mountain areas, we have desert areas, um, but there's an interaction. We have 1600 species of native bees. And so those two things working together uh, results in a, a vast diversity of plant species. Um, honeybees are not native to the United States and across the United States, there are 4,000 species of native bees, and honeybees are just a small part of um, the, the vast quantity of, of pollinators that we have. Also in California, we have more species of native bees than any other state, so yay. All right, so what to plant? All right, and one resource, I have several, but one that I love going to, it's fun to play around on this website, is the calscape.org um, database. It is chock full of information about plants, super easy to search um, and really easy to create a palette of trees, shrubs, perennials, bulbs, vines, and succulents. Okay, lots to go, uh, to go for here. Um, I did a screen, shot here um, and I just did a, a search for California and it says that we have 7,990 plants native to California and they break it down for you. All plants, trees, shrubs, perennials and so forth. But because I like to talk about food and who likes to eat the food, um, a better question really is who to feed, okay? We know that plant species need insects, pollinators to survive. And we also know that speciation, that is how plants evolve over time, happens more rapidly when you have pollinators in the environment. You don't have speciation as quickly with wind pollinated plants. So what does that tell us? That tells us that biological factors may be more important considerations than abiotic factors, non-biological factors like climate, geology, and water for determining what to plant. So you really have to start asking yourself, what particular insects do you have in your environment? 
And the great thing about the calscape.org website is that you can do a search for butterflies. And so I did a search for San Mateo County and you have 83 species of butterflies and moths. Okay, um, painted ladies, buckeyes, swallowtails, checker spots, uh, blues, skippers, a lot of different kinds and um, really just beautiful creatures. Okay, so where do you start? Um, you wanna start in terms of picking out your plants with your keystone plant genera. And what I mean by keystone species are these are the plants that form the backbone of your habitat or your garden. They provide a lot of food, a lot of shelter, and a lot of nesting sites. Okay, they're going to provide copious resources. That's what a keystone species is. It provides lots of food for dozens or hundreds of different uh, animals like caterpillars and other things. The takeaway technique here is to plant at least a few keystone plants to provide a strong and stable food web in your pollinator garden. Okay, so I'm gonna start with trees, keystone trees. And because we're talking about water too, uh, trees are great because they help save water, okay? They absorb water from the ground and release it into the air, cooling and cleaning the uh, air. Trees form half of the rain cycle. They team up with the oceans and they help circulate water across the land. When you don't have trees, deserts can form. Trees improve water quality. Uh, they filter rain and slow down the impacts of heavy rain and they stabilize soil. And um, you can just see what differences trees make. Here's a landscape without vegetation. And then uh, our Coast Live Oak here at Foothill Park um, here's my six foot three inch tall husband standing under there for scale, but you can see um, what a world of difference a single tree can make. California native trees, many species are drought tolerant once established. They form hubs for, for uh, wildlife to move around from tree to tree, lots of shelter in something this big. And trees can provide large nectar resources, as well as food for, for butterfly and moth larva. Okay, so how do you decide on a tree for your location? Um, well, go back to calscape.org and search your area and then rank, I like to rank things by the number of butterflies and moths that are hosted. So for San Mateo County, we have 22 trees native there. And I rank these already in the one that pops up high here is the Canyon Live Oak, okay? And if you don't see something that you like amongst these or that won't fit well in your landscape, expand the search area just a little bit more and you will find something that will work. After trees, go for your shrubs, your keystone shrubs. Um, again, rank them by the number of butterflies and moths hosted, which I, again, I've done that um, here and uh, for, San Mateo County, there are 71 different ones that are, that are native. So lots of different options, certainly to choose from. Perennials, and I'm not gonna go through this list here, but these are plants that we have in our uh, pollinator gardens. And literally every plant gets pollinated uh, in these gardens. We generate lots of seeds, um, but really there's hundreds to choose from. Um, and really, you just never get to the end. Um, I want to talk a little bit about annuals too. Annuals um, provide a huge variety of floral resources. Annuals are the most under threat natives from competition from non-native grasses. And you can get a huge variety of plants that are not available in nurseries typically. Super easy to grow, seeds are cheap. Um, you can successively sow the seeds and extend the bloom time. Um, you preserve genetic diversity. So a few annuals are really great to supplement your uh, trees and shrubs and other perennials. And three easy ones that we have in our gardens, poppies, wonderful, uh, our state flower. <clears throat> Gilia capitata, another super easy one. Um, and Phacelia tenacetifolia. These are three that are guaranteed uh, pollinator magnets. 
And then um, maybe there are some people watching who don't live in California and or maybe you're, if you're a plant nerd like myself and you want to cross reference with another database, <clears throat> you can go to the National Wildlife Federation Organization Native Plant Finder and do a search uh, by your area to look for native plants or butterflies and then you make a nice little list and you go from there. So an example from uh, the plant finder from the National Wildlife Federation, willow species. Um, willow is one of these powerhouse uh, plants in the environment. 328 species of butterflies and moths use this as a caterpillar host plant. So um, I actually have a willow in my front yard um, that I hand water. It seems to do just fine. And I planted it simply because of its uh, habitat uh, resources. So, okay, um, if you want to design a space, um, we've got to talk a little bit about some of the basics on how you do that. Now that you know where to get the plants, how do you put them into the garden? Well, let's consider the structure of the garden if you're a plant. And this is a screenshot from the calscape.org planting guide page. Um, and I love this picture because they show something like an oak, which has a tap root here that's tapping into the deep moisture or the groundwater. And then they also have a system of lateral roots that um, interact with fungus underground and they form these networks. And these networks transfer water and nutrients back and forth. And actually, these networks actually are communication networks between plants as well. So lots of interesting things happen underground. And this is my take on uh, this particular idea, because when you connect your species and your resources, you strengthen that whole web that you've created. And if you can enhance the complexity, it gets even stronger. So those strands become very, very strong. So. You have your big tree reaching down into the groundwater, pulling it up into the air with cloud formation. And you can create moisture gathering areas with swales, and that moisture sends uh, goes back into the groundwater. You can trap moisture with piles of leaves and twigs. And a technique that I like to use is to plant things close to a pile of leaves like this things that spread by runners. Those runners will go towards the moisture. And so you can direct the plants which way they're going um, by uh, moving around piles of leaves. You can also trap moisture with rocks. Um, you can get plants growing up at the edges of rocks very easily because those areas underneath rocks are generally cool and moist. Um, and so you have connectivity underground, connectivity, um, from underground to above ground and then across this way as well. As well. All right. So this is a habitat basics example or pollinator garden basics example. And really, um, let me walk you through this, um, this design. This is an imaginary design. It's not real. Um, so this is a house here, back here. There's a a window and a door, okay, that's a residence, and here's the property line or a fence. Here's their patio, okay. One thing I want to mention is that habitat gardens start inside the house. And what do I mean by that? Um, you need to put blackout shades on all your windows to keep light from escaping at night into the yard. Moths are attracted to light and light uh, keeps them fluttering against windows and at security lights that should really be on motion sensors. And what happens when the insects are out there is that they are eaten up by other insects or they die of exhaustion. And you can lose up to 60% of insect populations in a single night by lights outside. So really a habitat starts at the window. Um, and I always consider these gardens as buffets because I'm always thinking about what, what they're eating. What can I provide that's going to help them get as much food as possible? What you want to do is aim to plant at least 20 species of plants in your garden. That's the minimum, really. Um, 
several keystone species, again, chosen for richness of food resources, that is plants that provide pollen, which we're going to talk about in detail, nectar, can talk about that too, and larval food, which I like to call the three fur. Okay. Um, you want to reduce your amount of paving to enhance ground nesting for native bees because 70% of our native bees nest underground. You want to use swales to take up water from downspouts. Um, moist areas become prime real estate. And you want to take advantage of edges, lines in the landscape, because those provide visual cues for insects. They tend to follow edges of things when they're looking for mates or food. Okay, they're not really super intelligent, but they are really good at following edges. Um, and you want to plant at all scales and planes. Start with large things first, trees and shrubs, and then inc increase your complexity and your nutrients uh, with smaller plants, um, vines, ground covers, geophytes, which are bulbs, um, and succulents. So again, um, you know, and do big patches of things. Um, and again, a tip, a dark yard at night is good. And how do you know if your yard is dark enough? When you go out in the morning and you're watering things and stuff comes flying out, that's how you know. Okay. So um, again, um, you can have a, a beautiful swale like this one. This was actually a, a swale I designed and it is um, underneath some redwoods for a, of a client's house. And there is a, a tiny drain there. That's where the, uh, that's where the downspout opens up and then the water trickles down into the deep end here. Um, but we've planted it up around here with uh, native plants and then we have some boulders there. Looks very natural, it's really attractive, I think. And as I mentioned before, boulders do provide moisture um, traps, they trap moisture underneath. And so you'll have plants uh, very happily growing out at the edge of the base of, of boulders. Um, Moisture. If you don't have a water source in the garden, water sources are great. This is in my own backyard. This is a very cheap fountain that I picked up at or Orchard Supply. And um, it's great. Um, I clean the fountain very often. It's, mosquitoes are not a problem. If you do have mosquito issues, you can put in Bacillus thuringiensis, um, otherwise called as mosquito dunks, that takes care of the issue. Um, and I refill daily. And water is a huge magnet for all kinds of uh, critters. Okay, pollinator planting basics. There's yes, there's more. Um, so for bees, we've talked about larval food sources, but we also need to talk about um, what do bees like. And so for native bees, I'm not going to talk about honeybees here. Um, what you want to start with your plant palette should include at least three species for each of the early, the mid, and the late bloom times, or a total of nine different species, bare minimum. Uh, pollinators emerge at different times, and, and you need to provide overlapping bloom times to keep them foraging in the garden. If you have a wide diversity of plant resources, you'll have a huge diversity of insects um, coming to eat things. What they've discovered is that gardens with at least 20 different types of blooming plants is ideal for attracting a diversity of pollinators. Some studies indicate between 60 and 80 species is even better. So more is better. Uh, planting should occur in masses of a single species of at least three feet or more in diameter to enhance foraging efficiency. What I mean by foraging efficiency is that Bees perform what is called floral constancy. When they start with one type of flower, they generally stay with that type of flower before they switch to another one. They don't go from a rose to a daisy to a daffodil or whatever. They will go to a single type of species at once. And so if they're massed together, a single species, it's very efficient for the bee to go from flower to flower rather than from flower to flower. So they decrease the amount of time that they're spending foraging. So that's one way to help them. Um, and mass plantings are good because it takes a lot of pollen to make one baby bee. 
Um, one study showed that 85% of 41 bee species required all the pollen for more than 30 flowers for one larva, one bee. Other species required all of the pollen from over a thousand flowers. Okay, so uh, provide, provide abundance um, and you will have, you will, your garden will be buzzing with activity. Um, and you do want to leave areas of bare dirt, a little bit of mulch, not too thick is, is okay as well, so that bees can actually make their nests underground, okay? And because um, 70% of them do nest underground. Okay, so you're thinking, well, okay, so how do I do this? Where do I, how do I lay things out? Um, so don't be afraid um, to make a map of your property. And one thing that makes mapping your property easy, if you don't already have a plan showing your property, take some graph paper and a measuring tape, okay? Uh, measure your property and then use the graph paper to have one square equals a foot. And that makes it super easy to draw things out. Um, and then your graph paper, if it's, this looks like it's about an eighth of an inch, so it could be an eighth of an inch equals a foot. That's what I mean by two scale. So that particular scale is eighth inch, or maybe the, the squares are bigger on your graph paper, they could be a quarter inch. So that would be a quarter inch equals a foot. Whatever you use, graph paper is super easy. Figure out which way is north. Um, and once you have everything down, your house, your fences, things that you want to keep, um, what I tell people is don't go for the plants right away. Think about your movement through the garden. Where are your pathways? Okay, is there a patio over here going to another patio? It's helpful to have a pathway um, because you're going to have to maintain the garden and water things and do all kinds of things. So put your, put your pathways in first, your areas for humans first. Everything that's left over becomes a planting space. Um, so that creates structure, creates nice edges. Remember edges are good. Um, and then add plants as circles at their mature diameter. Okay, so big stuff like this, okay, and medium stuff. And what you want to do is just have the circles overlap a little bit or just barely touch, okay? And that's how you get the spacing correct. If you figure the mature size of a plant and things grow actually pretty quickly here, um, then you won't end up with a jungle. You know, every, almost everybody overplants. I'm guilty of it myself, I know. But, um, you know, we, we keep uh, foraging onward. Um, plant in masses of at least, again, three feet in diameter to enhance foraging efficiency. Start with your large stuff first, trees, then your shrubs, and then your perennials, and then the smaller things, and leave bare dirt. So super easy, really, to uh, space out your plants. Then you can see how many that you'll need, and then you add them over time as it allows. Let's talk about those pollinators. Uh, the more I look at, at insects, and I go out to my own pollinator gardens uh, about twice a week to take uh, macro photography pictures of, of what I see to document the uh, organisms. Um, the pollinator basically is an organism that moves the pollen um, the male from the male part of the flower to the female part. Okay, that causes the fertilization of the flower and then it produces seeds. The majority of pollination that occurs happens with bees. There are other things that do some incidental pollination because they happen to be on a flower and then they go to another flower, but the vast majority are bees. Okay, um, and we find that 87% of all plants and 97% of flowering plants require pollinators to set seed. So if we don't have pollinators, um, we're not gonna have plants. We'll, we may have some wind pollinated plants, but that's not going to sustain life on planet earth. Um, and what I have noticed and other people have also noticed is that plants in the environment um, in a natural area are a reflection of the pollinators present. Okay, so here's a, a little tiny sweat bee uh, chowing down on some Calicortus luteus. This is a bulb that we have growing here. And I like to differentiate between 
whether they're eating pollen or, or eating nectar, okay? Um, because I like to see whether they're interested in the pollen resources or the nectar resources. So um, as I mentioned before, gardens with native plants seem to encourage other native plants to colonize. Um, so here's a, a picture over at the Primrose Garden. Here is Epilobium ciliatum growing. I did not plant this. It blew in from somewhere. And the culprit is this little bee here. This is Anthrophora. This is a little uh, ground nesting bee. And that's the mouth part that is a nectar. Uh, that's where the mouth part, the, the, the tongue comes out. You can see it almost exactly matches the flower structure. So this is what is responsible for this. Okay. So um, this bee is drinking nectar from Helianthus californica. This is actually my own home garden, but you can see how she's being coated with pollen. The thing about bees is that they are literally the only insect on planet earth, there might be one species of ants, that feed their young pollen. That's the sole source of protein for their offspring is pollen. They might eat a little themselves, but for the most part, the females are gathering up the pollen for their larva. Other insects feed other insects to their babies, but not bees. Bees are vegetarians uh, for the most part, and that's what they feed their offspring. So you have to have pollen if you want bees because they're feeding it to their babies. Okay, and I like Helianthus californica because it provides abundance. This is a nonstop bloomer for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, late term in the garden. And um, it is also the larval food source for about 31 species of butterflies and moths. So really a powerhouse plant. So pollen, as I mentioned, <laughs> we're gonna talk about it some more. Um, few insects other than bees rely on pollen as a sole source of protein to feed their offspring, their larva. Um, it's a, the source of protein and it ranges, not all pollens are created equally. You have uh, a range from between two and a half percent to about 61% uh, protein, fats, starches, vitamins and minerals, pretty tasty and nutritious. Um, it's very stable. Um, the, the outer coating on the pollen is very resistant to change and it can be stuck in layers of soil for thousands of years and can tell you what grew there 10,000 years ago. Um, and it is not all created equally. Different bee species um, are, some have uh, specific pollen that they use to raise their, raise their young. And if you try to raise those particular species on another pollen, they will not live. So you have to have uh, food sources for those specialist bees uh, if you want to have more of those. Um, pollen is generally yellow in color, but it comes in a lot of different colors. And the color comes from the sticky coating that's um, on the surface of a pollen grain, and that's called the pollen kit. And it's made up of basically some saturated and unsaturated fats, carotenoids, flavonoids, and so forth. And that part's easily digestible, but um, the way that they think that pollen is actually digested in the bee's stomach is that um, it basically, the pollen germinates in the stomach and, and then the, the outer coating of it is opened and because the outer coating is very difficult to digest. Um, and also pollen kit uh, may play a role in cloud formation because it has the ability to absorb water uh, from the air. So um, the takeaway habitat technique here is plant for pollen specialist. Okay, there are bees that, again, will only go for one type of pollen. You have the vast majority of bees, I think, are generalist foragers, which means that they'll forage on just about anything. Bumblebees are a good example of that. Here we have um, the Bombus vosnesenskii here, one of the, the two that we have in Palo Alto, two bumblebee species. And you can see they are on a, a variety of plants. They're not picky about what they eat. So bumblebees are generalist foragers. Um, the ability to carry pollen. So this is really important. You have your, your bees 
foraging, then they have to take that back to the nest. How are they getting it back to the nest? Okay, well, um, it depends really um, on a couple of things, whether they have these furry hind legs, some of them pack it into a pollen basket, other bees like this leaf cutter carry it on their abdomens. Um, and although bees can fly long distances, they prefer not to really, because it just takes away time that they have for gathering food to make more bees. So um, uh, between 150 feet to 1500 feet between nests and flowers is about as much as you want to have. So if you have a lot of resources in your yard, you're going to have ne bees nesting in your yard because if you have plenty of food, they're not going to want to go long distances. They're going to stay right there and reproduce and you'll have quite the safari. Um, you want to have things, again, blooming all year long, but there are bees that come out super early. Um, bumblebees especially come out during the colder temperatures because they can regulate their body temperatures, um, which is fascinating to me. And here we have, um, this is Bombus melanopigus, the black-tailed bumblebee, the other one of the two that we have here in Palo Alto. And you can see she's packed in some pollen and nectar on her back leg there. And um, so the pollen actually is brushed off from the anthers onto her fur, and then she grooms it into her uh, uh, pollen basket here. And uh, bees that are fuzzy like this do generate a, a static charge. So when they get land on a flower, the flower has an opposite electrical charge, and the pollen jumps on to the bee. Who knew? So um, the plant that we have here, and I love this, particular species. This is Ceanothus valley violet. Blooms in January or in February, super early um, for these, uh, these early emergers. Actually, bumblebees really do like a, a cooler temperature. And so you'll see them uh, this time of, uh, th that time of year in uh, December, even um, January and February. So here's another tiny bee and she's on Grindelia. Grindelia species is another plant species that is super great in the environment. Um, here you can see she's actually um, getting the pollen grains off the anther. They're falling into her abdomen and then she's grooming them into her uh, scopa here on her back legs to carry back to the nest. And you notice her antennae are touching the anther as well. And Antennae are great because they provide a sense of touch, taste, and smell, and hearing, okay, sort of like a, a tongue that sticks out of the head. Um, and so she knows that this is the good stuff. Here's another one, uh, gathering pollen from Salvia apiana. And here you can see the mouth parts down here. And just she's just coated with a Salvia, the white sage pollen, okay. And she's going to transport that back to the nest and make some more baby bees. So pollen, OK, very important thing to have. But nectar, nectar, sugar, so good. Sugar is the fuel of the engine uh, of the environment. Sugar is what keeps the engine running, OK? Um, it provides energy for flight so that they can go from flower to flower, back and forth to nest, and so forth. And so the proportions and the presence of whatever type of sugar that you have in nectar um, depends on the plant species. Um, some is really concentrated, some is less concentrated. The less concentrated or more liquidy nectar is easier for long-tongued bees to drink, like bumblebees. Um, what we find is that nectar secretion, the, the uh, oozing out of the sugar water, increases with pollinator visits and then declines after pollination and frequently is reabsorbed into the plant. And if you have tubular flowers, those flowers actually preserve the viscosity so that the nectar does not evaporate, okay? Um, there may be some antimicrobial properties, so nectar is super important. One plant that we like to use in our gardens is monardella, uh, Velosa, which is, I like to think of it as a sugar pump in the environment because it's 
if you water, um, you'll get never ending blooms on it. And this, uh, the pollinators, you get butterflies, bumblebees, um, little tiny wasps, all kinds of um, uh, insects will nectar on Monardella. Some other great pictures um, of insects in the environment having uh, a go here at the pollen on Grindelia, again, a really great plant for uh, the environment. Uh, coffee berry, they have these tiny, tiny blossoms. And like I said, you know, sometimes plants aren't decorations, but um, because, I mean, these blossoms are really small and not terribly showy, not to us anyway, but very attractive to certain kinds of insects. And then uh, Isocoma menziesii, um, attractive to this cute little leaf cutter here, as well as to this uh, masked bee over here. You can see that there's a little mask here in front of the eye. Um, another uh, annual here, Clarkia amoena, great for the specialists um, who like to eat the specialist pollen. And Clarkia amoena, super showy. Clarkias are very showy plants. Um, and if you really want to get your neighbors jealous, a few seeds of these go a long way for that. Uh, Leptosiphon, a tiny little plant. But again, tiny little, tiny little bees gathering big wads of, of pollen and nectar here. And Monardella is also a great source of pollen, who knew? Um, again, providing the two things that we need. And then um, our state flower, poppy, this is Eschelosia californica, this is Maritima. And um, poppies are an interesting flower because they only provide pollen. So I think of it as kind of the one-stop pollen stop for, um, or pollen shop for, um, for pollinators. You can see we've got bumblebees here, we've got little tiny, this looks like Glassia glossum over here, some little beetles, okay, um, really provides a lot. Um, asters, have to have asters in a garden uh, because they provide pollen for specialist bees as well as generalist species, so we have get bumblebees on them, we get leaf cutter bees, you can always tell leaf cutter by that abdomen, um, this is Melissoides. You can always tell that by the big puffy pantaloons here on the back leg. Um, and I'm not exactly sure which one that is, but again, a lot of bees will uh, visit this, even though it is a plant for a uh, pollen specialist. Um, flowers that are tubular or enclosed, again, are good for nectar. So here's Arctostaphylus, and this is a, um, an orchard bee here. And this is again uh, Bombus Vosk Nesinskii, and you can see she's got her mouth open there looking for some nectar. Um, Penstemons again for nectar. Bumblebees love them. Um, even the small bees go for it, and they're just really super beautiful plants. Penstemons are great. They are a plant that likes it super hot and dry, so if you have a dry sunny spot, uh, penstemons are your friend. Um, in praise of Phacelias, so there's a few different species of Phacelia. Uh, Phacelia tanacetifolia. This is, is like candy to bumblebees. Um, super high quality nectar in this plant. You can see here's a, a, vas, a, a Bombus vosnesenskii queen here. She's been collecting the pollen as well as the nectar. She's got these blue pollen. Um, uh, bags here on the on her back leg there. The mouth is the mouth parts are ready. She's going for the sugar. Um, another small bee. This looks like a, a um, leaf cutter as well, going in for the sugar. And then um, that's Phacelia bolanderi and then Phacelia Californ californica over there. So super great plant to have and a lot of different choices in the Phacelia fam family. Um, Origeron species, the, um, the seaside daisy, as it were, super easy to grow and really easy to grow from cuttings. Okay, a few facts about bees. Um, we tend to have a lot of blue flowers in our uh, gardens because blue tells a bee that there's going to be some nectar there. White and yellow flowers tell them it's going to be there's going to be pollen. That's a very general rule. Bees seem to remember blue flowers better than other colors. Um, and um, 
that's really all I want to say about that. Um, so maintenance, um, how do you take care of a garden once you have it in there? Um, you know, these gardens change the soil. And so you want to keep weeds at bay initially, but what you'll find is that weeds will decrease over time because the plants are changing the soil chemistry and are making it easier for more natives to come in, but maybe not so many non-natives. Um, you want to irrigate the first one to three years, kind of establish those plants and then adjust your watering as needed. Um, not watering on hot days because you don't want the soil to be too moist on a hot day because that will encourage the wrong kind of fungus. Um, wait to prune and I'll talk about that for a while uh, in a little while. Don't fertilize the soil. Um, I, I take hand, handfuls of compost once about once a year and place them around uh, the base of plants. Um, that seems to be good, but really um, amend sparingly. You want to mulch to control weeds and to establish the plants um, and leave areas of bare dirt for nests. Don't use leaf blowers because you will be blowing out the caterpillars and the insects that are hiding in your leaves, which you want to leave in place. And also don't use pesticides, don't use herbicides, and don't use fungicides. Anything that's gonna kill something else is going to affect uh, bees. Okay, bees are stressed out enough as it is with a lot of different kinds of environmental insults. And this is kind of like just a little herbicide or a little fungicide, you know, it's like the straw that breaks the camel's back. You keep adding these insults and then um, bad things happen. Leaves is mulch. Leaves are great. Leaves prevent weeds. They hold the soil in place. Um, insulate the soil, keep it moist and cool. And what we know about the way that insects are on trees is that they'll be eggs on a tree, they'll turn into larva, and then they'll drop down to the ground. Now, if you have a patio under a tree, you're going to discover that you're probably not going to have as many cat, uh, butterflies as if you did. You had a, a bunch of leaves under the trees. Butterflies, as larvae, when they drop to the ground, prefer to drop down into a nice soft leaf bed. And that's where they will hang out until they turn into, uh, into butterflies later. Uh, leaves encourage fungal decomposition, which is a good thing. Um, if you don't like the way that leaves look, and um, you know it's a matter of taste, you can use what I like to call the skim coat of mulch which is one bark chip thick layer on the top just so it looks uniform. And really three inches or less uh, deep for leaf uh, litter under um, plants. So if you leave the leaves, you'll have crickets, you'll have other insects, you'll have moths, and then you'll have birds going after them. So pro tip, leave the leaves. Save yourself the work. Don't use leaf blowers. They're noisy. They, if you're using a gas-powered ones, they they pollute the air, um, and annoy the neighbors. Uh, bare soil is important. Um, so if you look sometimes at the ground and you see little tiny things buzzing around, buzzing, 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 and then they disappear, that means they've gone into a little burrow. And um, you know. We have a pretty, this is, these are all pictures taken at the Island Drive Garden, and we have a pretty robust, a consistent colony of these little, um, these are probably helictids of some kind, um, foraging uh, at Island Drive. And this is a small area for their nest entrances, about two feet by two feet, so not a huge area, but, you know, and there's some leaf litter here and there, but they can still get to the, to the ground. And I try not to walk in this area because I don't want to crush the entrance to the to the nest. So I, I tend to tiptoe through the planted areas. Pruning decisions. Um, I tend to really, really not prune until I have absolutely have to because things are in the way, branches are overhanging pathways and stuff like that. Um, because plants are providing shelter, I don't want to do a you know, just go in with a, a big chainsaw and prune things. I want to come in with my hand pruners and be very careful because I don't want to trim out somebody's shelter. So 
depending on what they're doing, they might pull a leaf together like that and hide. Um, they might be laying eggs. These are katydid eggs on a scrofularia over here in this uh, lower corner. Um, and um, so basically here, look closely before you prune. Look to see if there are eggs. Look to see if there are things actively hiding. Um, and because these plants are, are shelter and nesting sites. Um, and a number of species will nest in hollow stems. And so we, <clears throat> we deadheaded a large patch of hummingbird sage over at the Island Drive Garden. And hummingbird sage has a, a, a hollow stem. And it formed a nice little place for this uh, female wasp to go in and to lay some eggs. So pro tip for a place to lay eggs, leave about eight to 12 inches of stem in place, especially if it's hollow like this. And um, these are places where bees will create nest cells from the bottom upwards. This is in my own garden. I grow a small patch of not, it's non-running, but it's clumping bamboo. So I'll have plant stakes and bamboo is hollow. And this leaf cutter bee came out she had, and this was staking up some of my tomatoes, and she came out and was foraging in my own garden. And I was like, oh, okay. So um, now I know um, that they like the bamboo stakes. So I'll put, put more of those out there for them. But you also want to uh, create as much complexity so that you can create good uh, shelter and nesting places as possible. And over at the Gwenda Street Garden, um, somebody donated some logs. So I dump them over there. They're kind of rotting in the middle there. And that creates a lot of interesting habitat for um, all kinds of creatures. One of the things I do know about the gardens is that sometimes it's hard to find an insect because insects eat other insects. And so it's probably not a good thing to be easy to find if you're an insect because you're going to be somebody's dinner. Um, and the insects that we do see, um, the caterpillars, um, remember this is a part of their life cycle and a lot of insects spend a lot of time as larva or an egg. The adult portion of the life doesn't really last all that long for a lot of insects, maybe as short as a couple of weeks. Okay, so we wanna be thinking about all stages of development. So your ongoing decisions, and I think I have one more slide after this, um, in terms of your pollinator habitat um, and what you do there in terms of maintenance, in terms of adding plants, um, what you decide should be influenced by what you see, what you are observing, what you're researching. And if you're adding things, you ask yourself, does this plant provide forage for my local insect species? Is it a keystone species? Am I going to get the most bang for my buck when I plant this in terms of habitat resources? And that's really key. Most of our yards are not that big. And so do we want to waste space with something that's only going to feed two or three species? Or do we want to put in something that maybe will feed 300? Okay, 300 species is going to make those, those connections and those webs much stronger, okay? Ask yourself how much water is needed. Remember, the more complex your environment is, the more water sharing that's gonna happen underground, okay? Um, look for the nesting opportunities. Is it hard to grow? I like to grow a lot of things from seed because I can get things that I can't normally find in nurseries. Um, you know, how is it going to enhance the resources in the garden? And then super critical, think of your own residential garden. How is it connected to a larger space? Are you near a park? Are you near an open wildland? Are you near um, a community garden? What you see in your garden will be a reflection of what's in those adjacent areas. So look closely before you do anything. This is what I try to do. Um, I didn't start out knowing all of this stuff. It took a few years to get to this point um, because information doesn't reveal itself all at once because it would be overwhelming. So you add bits and pieces as you go and fill in the blanks and add stories and chapters and all that stuff. 
And remember that the scale of the insect is very different than ours, okay? So look, 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 look and observe and read. So what I mean by scale, so here's a great picture on Silene, and here's a little tiny baby Katie did staring out at me. I did not see it until I looked at the picture later. So again, um, it's a very different world for insects. And um, you know, a surprising number of things actually eat poppies. This is Neoterpes edward seda, which is a nice little uh, yellow moth that comes out um, from there. We have them all over our gardens. So final thoughts about all of this. And um, in terms of ecosystem services, native plants enhance what you see in nature in ways that you can't even imagine. It shows you interrelationships that you didn't know were there, but they were always there. And dis the discovery, um, I think, really enhances your enjoyment. Um, and that enjoyment of nature um, will spread to other things. Your enjoyment of the beauty and the complexity um, makes you just, you can, you just become more compassionate as you uh, see all the life um, being enhanced. And that is uh, the end of my story. Okay. Okay, so. Thank you gonna... so much. Yeah, <laughs> yes. thank you. We have some questions and uh, Megan will start with um, the first question. All right. Yeah. Let me get rid of my screen share here. Okay, yes. Yeah. So our, our first That was question. excellent, by the way, Juanita. Yes. Oh, yeah. well, thank you. <laughs> it's always fun talking about this stuff. I love it. So our first question is, what proximity should you have between your, quote, edible garden of green leafy vegetables, et cetera, and your, quote, native pollinator garden that attracts caterpillars, et cetera? So I have uh, a great answer to that question. It's plant, interplant things. So if you, so for example, in my own private home garden, I have my cherry tomatoes planted in with my um, native plants. And I do that because tomatoes are one of these uh, plants that are buzz pollinated, which means honeybees can't do it. So I need bumblebees to do it for me. And so the native plants are going to attract those uh, bumblebees and they'll see these, these tomato blossoms. Ugh and I have as many cherry tomatoes as I can possibly deal with. <laughs> so interplant them together. There should be no reason to separate them. If you have caterpillars, remember there's a food chain. And um, I have on my Instagram, if you ever go back and scroll through it, you can see um, one picture. I really debated on putting it up, but it's a, a wasp decapitating a katydid and taking it back to feed its young. So. You know, it's well, all about the meal time. <laughs> I don't worry about about insects. Um, they can worry about themselves, really. Great. Okay, and we have a couple of questions about small yards. Um, so one, so Edith said, if you have a small yard, how can you fit in twenty plus species with each species three feet in diameter? And someone um, else, just to follow up. I also just asking about tips for planting native plant gardens in small spaces, what types of plants and species to emphasize when we don't have a lot of room. So, um, you know, that's an excellent question. And I have a technique which I like to call layering. And so um, in a small space, I will find a, sh a shrub, usually a tree may be too large. Let's think of a small side yard, for example. Um, and in a side yard, what is the one shrub I can plant that's going to really provide a, a keystone function for me? So maybe an Arctostaphylus, okay, a manzanita. That's going to get, you know, maybe four or five feet tall and wide. That is going to grow up in kind of a vase shape and kind of rounded. I can grow vines up into it from underneath. I can plant uh, native bulbs that will come up underneath and then die back. I can put in uh, a ground cover in there. So I layer things in the same space. 
Um, I know I talked about layering things with like separated um, for spacing, you know, with the circles overlapping. Mm -hmm. But then within that context, I sprinkle in certain seeds um, amid, among my perennials because they will come up, they will die back, they will reseed themselves. Mm -hmm. And they, they're, it can be done. Um, you can stick in tiny succulents here and there, tucking them into little crevices and nooks and crannies. Um, really the question is um, not um, how to, you know, how you can fit them is how you can stop from putting more. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it can be done. There's, there's, there are ways to do it. Um, you know, if you're, if you're really limited in space and you can't get nine species in, um, you know, like you may want to pick three good species to, to fit in and the ones that are super easy to take care of um, and provide a lot for a lot of different animals. Um, one plant that really fits the bill is uh, Areogonum. And there are lots of different species. You have Areogonum fasciculatum, which is a large shrub. Um, and you also have ones that are like uh, Areogonum latifolium, which is the coastal buckwheat, which is much smaller. And um, there are lots of different kinds of Areogonums. But um, within a particular species, you can uh, choose different sizes of plants. So um, it, it just you just have to take some time and make a good plan and research what it is that your goals are in terms of, you know, what kinds of pollinators do you want to attract? And, you know, how many plants can you really cram into a small space? It's surprising. You can get a lot in there. Yeah. Great, thank you. So our next question from Peggy, you had shown the picture of um, logs and stems and good places for insects to nest. How do you assure that termites don't come into those logs and stems? Um, there's really no uh, assurances. Um, and so those logs are not close to a dwelling. They're in the middle of a garden. And I don't really care that there's, you know, termites eating things in there um, because they will form the food for some other insect. Um, you know, I don't try to control what kinds of insects are doing things and, you know, or if there's these spiders on that and these wasps here or there, because I provide an abundance of species as well as a huge diversity of them. Mm -hmm. um, the insects kind of work it out and so I just kind of ignore that. I, I think of myself more as the caterer. You know, if you're a caterer, you don't try to control, fill their plates up. You know? <laughs> it's like, okay, the hot dishes are here and the salads are over there. You guys go, really. Right. Yeah. I like that. Okay, great. And JD is in San Mateo County and she, er, she's asking, which month would you recommend to start planting? And how difficult was it to remove the ivy to start your pollinator garden? Ah, uh, so uh, great questions. The planting, I would start now to uh, get going because the weather is cooling down at night, which is good. Um, and it's cooler during the early parts of the day and the evening. Um, and the rains are coming. So plant, get things planted now. It might be hard because the ground is still hard. Um, but you'll be that much further ahead when the rain starts. So just plant things, start planting now, water things in well. Um, and um, the other question was, what was that other question? Um, how difficult was it to remove the ivy ah. to start? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. So um, I have a confession. I did not remove the ivy myself. Um, at the Island Drive Garden and also the Gwinda Garden, the the wonderful, generous city of Palo Alto um, had somebody come in and first mow it down, then they tilled it up, and then they grubbed it out. Um, thank goodness. Um, but, you know, at the Island Drive Garden, I get maybe a sprig every six months coming up because ivy is actually kind of a wimpy plant. And at the Gwinda Garden, where it had been um, in existence for decades, um, a few sprigs here and there. I mean, we pulled out initially handfuls at a time, but it's pretty much given up. 
So once you get it out, it's pretty easy to control from ever coming back. So um, yeah, don't let don't 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 let that stop you. Mow that <laughs> mow that sucker down and <laughs> and go to town on it. <laughs> Awesome. The questions keep coming in. So uh, Richard would like to know uh, if there is a list of flowers that you've mentioned throughout your PowerPoint where he can find that. And then also Anne and Richard both ask, where do you like to obtain and buy your seeds? So two questions there. What was the second one again? Where do you like to purchase your seeds? Oh, or yes. <laughs> oh, this I could talk for hours. So um, um, the, the, the seed purchases, um, I, you know, if you go on calscape.org, they have links to nurseries. Where are these plants available? And then you can go um, on the nursery websites and look to see at their availability list if those things are currently available, which is great. Um, some places like Annie's Annuals does mail order, which is even better because <laughs> I'm super lazy. I don't like to go anywhere. Um, and then seeds, I get seeds from wherever I can find them. Um, I like Larner seeds up in Bolinas is really good. Seed Hunt down in Freedom is another wonderful source. Um, Sacred Succulents up in Sebastopol. You know, you go on the websites and you just look to see what they have to offer. And um, sometimes I'll, I'll get a specific plant in mind that I really want, you know, at, with almost 8,000 species, I'm usually wanting a new plant every day, at least. So I'll search to see who has seeds of these plants and then I'll try to grow them myself. And so I have a backyard nursery of, of all kinds of items. And then I, uh, other uh, people share seeds with me um, that I've, you know, I have quite a community on Instagram. And so we share seeds back and forth. So sometimes if you can't find it, um, at a nursery or online, um, you know, social media isn't all evil. Sometimes it's a great resource for finding what you need. So wherever I can find seeds, I've gotten seeds from Great Britain, actually. The British are real big uh, California native plant lovers. <laughs> they have a huge variety over there. Awesome. And it sounds like the list of flowers you've mentioned, all or a lot of your PowerPoint was from uh, Calscape. Is that right? Yep. Calscape is, is really great. Calflora, um, both done by the California Native Plant Society, um, which is really a remarkable society. They work hard at helping maintain the diversity of our, of our biological riches that we have here in the state, which are numerous. Awesome. And then uh, it can't, this question came in while you were talking about timing for planting. Uh, Teresa asked, can we still plant in midwinter? Oh, absolutely. Yes. So um, I like to start planting about now and um, I will continue to plant up until about May. So all the way through winter because <clears throat> we don't really have winter here. I mean, it gets cold and rainy, but we don't have three feet of snow. <laughs> and so um, planting becomes much easier in, in, the, in the rainy season, except when the ground is super muddy. Um, then it becomes harder because you know it's just really hard to work with mud. So um, that's why I say start now. Um, if the holes are hard to dig, uh, what I will do is um, dig a small hole, fill it full of water, move on to the next hole, and then go back to it once it's soaked in and kind of loosened up the soil. So start now and continue until May until, or until you run out of plants, which may never happen. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, a few more questions here. So are all caterpillars good? Uh, Charlene says she has moth caterpillars that covered her lupin, and now that doesn't look so very good. Yeah, so um, what, what happens sometimes when a plant gets inundated with a single species, like a caterpillar infestation, it just means that there aren't enough resources to attract enough predators uh, to eat them. And so the way to combat that is to um, have lupin as part of your 20 plus species of plants in there. Um, that's not to say that they, they won't still do that, but the chances are if you provide uh, a diversity of resources, you'll have a bunch of different predators 
that are going to go after those caterpillars and take care of them for you. So um, that's one way to get around it. If you can't stand it or if you just have that one lupin or uh, not a ton of native plants, you can go in there and hand pick them off, which is always a treat. But, you know, however you'd like to do it, um, uh, just don't use any sort of herbicides or pesticides or any of those things. And then she also had a follow up question um, just in Pacifica. Uh, the, if the lupin died all of a sudden, what would be a good replacement specifically for that plant? So lupins don't live very long. Um, you know, if you get two years out of a lupin, that's more than I usually get. My lupins usually die after one season. Um, replace it with another lupin. Um, you know, um, that, you know, a lot of the kind of the big, fast growing shrubby plants, they live fast and die soon. <laughs> so, um, and lupins, unfortunately, are one of them. And we do have a number of short lived perennials uh, like that and short lived shrubs. So, um, and that's, you know, that's a piece of information I think that should be included in Calscape is about what's the lifespan of some plants. Because um, that can be mysterious sometimes. Great. All right. Phil had a question. Said we have all non-native street trees: red oak, hackberry, linden, California pepper. Do caterpillars or other insects overwinter in non-native leaves if that's all that's there, or just in leaves of native plants? You know, I don't know. Um, my guess is that they they would probably. Um, be more prolific underneath a native tree simply because that's what their eggs were laid on. Um, because remember, that's how they're overwintering is that they get laid on vegetation, they'll eat the vegetation, then they drop down in the leaf litter. Um, if you have something like a ginkgo, for example, um, which, you know, it looks great <laughs> um, because it doesn't have a lot of um, insect damage um, but that also means that there's nothing that's dropping down and living because it's not it's a kind of a ecological dead end so i would guess that uh, leaf litter made up of non-native uh, leaves if you push them towards plants that are natives um, mm. at that point i think because the leaves are decomposing it's they're probably not being used by the larva at that point um, so you could use those leaves under native plants, um, but you just, if you leave them under the tree that they fell from, probably isn't doing a lot of anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Peggy is wondering how can we stop developers and city landscape people from continuing to plant grasses instead of flowers and colorful things? Uh. <laughs> um, so, you know, what really is called for in this case is to become, you know, a citizen of your community and to take over, um, um, I shouldn't say take over, to, uh, main, to install and maintain spaces and raise the visibility of these spaces so that people become educated um, and that you have um, other people who are asking for those changes um, and also to, to reach out to those developers and other people and, and say, you know, okay, so you, you're a developer, you are a designer or whatever, you know, are you following form follows function? And you can say, well, your plants don't function as plants in this particular case. So you really can't say that you're doing form follows function because the plants are not functioning. Um, I, you know, I think you can have really good conversations with people, but I think um, to become engaged in the communities where things happen, um, you know, that's been the benefit of doing the gardens here in Palo Alto is that um, you are able to uh, change maybe slowly the way things happen or how things have been for a long time. Um, and you know, not be afraid of doing that and asking for per permission, you know, and saying, you know, I am a person of this community. You know, this is my voice. Is these are my concerns, and make yourself heard. Yeah, that's 
great advice. Next question. Um, I have two very large live oak trees at opposite ends of my yard. What to plant underneath? How thick should I let the leaves pile up? And how to deal with squirrels digging everywhere? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Um, All the things. <laughs> yeah. So there are a lot of different things that are great to plant under oaks. And that's actually one of the things that Calscape has uh, for great under oaks. Hummingbird sage is a great one to go under oaks. Um, but there are, there are a bunch of other things too. Um, squirrels, you know, I have, I must have uh, a thousand squirrels that I deal with in my own yard. And they do plant acorns for me but I use wire baskets on top of my plants. I use chicken wire. Um, I make wire baskets to go on the top of things um, because this is, they're a huge problem um, for me. Um, and mechanical barriers like that are the only things that work for me. That makes sense. All right. And Next one from Edith, which natives are easy to grow from seeds? Oh, it depends on what you want. Um, many of the annuals are super easy to grow. Um, things like tidy tips are easy to grow. Um, Clarkias are super easy to grow. Um, and so annuals in general are easy um, because they like to pop up the first year and do their thing and then spread their seeds and whatnot. Uh, perennials, it really depends. Um, you know, I've been experimenting with everything from coffee berry seeds to um, uh, viola oscillata, which is our one of our native violets. And what I do for seeds, and I have a YouTube video on, on this whole seed thing where I do cold moist stratification where I, if I don't know a seed, I will take it, put it into a wet coffee filter that I've labeled, put it into a plastic baggie, seal it up and stick it in the fridge and then see how long it takes to germinate. And then once it's germinated, once that little root tip comes out, it goes into a pot. That's, um, that's how I, you know, and I only do the ones that are sprouted and it don't, plant everything all at once because otherwise you're staring at a pot of dirt for weeks waiting for things to grow. And quite frankly, the viola oscillata took six months to germinate in the refrigerator. So, and some things sprout really readily. Other things can take a year to sprout or even three years or whatever the species are. There's a huge range. So, um, but lots to experiment and play with certainly. And hopefully we can squeeze in one more question from Richard. How can I get rid of poison oak without using pesticides? He purchased burnout, which was recommended by a neighbor because it's supposed to be organic and at least not as bad as Roundup. Well, um, boy, so not knowing what the poison oak situation looks like. I mean, poison oak is a great habitat plant. Sorry, <laughs> it just is. Um, so one of the things that I like to do when I have plants that I don't like and I want to get rid of them because of whatever reason is I take some heavy things. As a landscape architect, I get a lot of stone samples. And so I'll take those and those go on top of things that I don't like and basically squish them and keep them from sprouting. Um, so that's one way some people might do um, sheet mulching, which is basically taking layers and layers of cardboard, um, like six layers of cardboard, and then topping it with like six inches of mulch or something like that. Um, the really determined stuff will come back up through that. Um, so those are those are ways to do it. Um, you know, one other way is to uh, find a level of poison oak that you can live with, and um, you know, plant other things in there. So certainly a lot of different approaches depending on the severity of the problem. Great. I think, I believe we have to wrap things up. Is that right, Shelley? 
Yeah, we should. I did notice that a couple of people asked your username for Instagram. You've already made some fans, Juanita, so we want to follow you. <laughs> yes, uh, that would be Primrose Way Pollinator Garden, both on Instagram. On Facebook, um, I'm, it's easier, as you know, to post articles, and I have a lot of scientific articles posted there as well. Um, and of course, the Primrose Way, just Primrose Way for the YouTube channel. I think I have maybe three or four videos so far. Um, but Primrose Way Pollinator Garden, um, check me out. Check out some of my followers. We're a great community of, of people who are plant nerds, and um, we're a fun group. Uh, thank you so much. I really want to thank everyone for attending this evening and really great questions. And thank you, Juanita, so much. I, I always learn so much every time um, we, we have your workshop. And thank you, Megan and Andrea. And um, have a good evening, everyone. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Good night. Bye. Bye. <laughs>